Be before I start, just to make sure it's clear once again about the Orion questions, which we sort of I walked away from to an extent long, long ago, and hopefully they'll change things uh, on that website. What I expect of you at this point is to just do Orion questions on your own for the first nine chapters. That's as far as we're ever going to go in this class. And do an average of 20 of them per chapter. If you'd want to do 180 of them on chapter three, that's good enough. As long as you do <coughs> something approaching that number, and okay, more than that number, <coughs> you're good. I'll give you full participation grade. That's, it's, it, it, it didn't work out the way I wanted it to, but, but doing those Orion questions, at least it tells you, it tells you uh, what the right answer is and whether you, it gives you a, the opportunity to look at a solution. You can dismiss the, what is it, the uh, pre-assessment, it's got a name, diagnostic. You can dismiss that diagnostic. That is not so helpful. It doesn't give you any feedback. <coughs> Sorry. It's a sign of the season, right? Cold's everywhere. All right. So air conditioners. The story of air conditioners uh, uh, is, is starts really with, with the laws of thermodynamics. And I, I've never really figured out a satisfying way of, of sort of demonstrating them one at a time. So I'm just spitting them out. So the first one, I told you, I've told you these last time. The first one is just the law of thermal equilibrium. The, the, the fact that if you've got three objects and A, B, and C, and A and C don't exchange heat when you touch them, and B and C don't exchange heat when you touch them, you know that A and B then will not exchange heat if you touch them. It's just. Uh, underlying the whole, the whole notion of temperature. Objects that are, that are in thermal equilibrium, that is, that, that do not exchange heat when you touch them, have the same temperature. So not surprisingly, if, if A and C have the same temperature, and B and C have the same temperature, A and C have to have the same temperature. It would, it would be a crazy world if that weren't the case. So it is the case. The second, the, 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 the next law is the law of uh, conservation of energy. And that observes, ultimately, that you can add energy to an object by doing work on it, as we've known all along. That's the mechanical means for, for adding energy to it. But there's also the thermal means of adding energy to it. If you let heat flow into it, its energy goes up as well. So heat and work are, heat is the thermal means of transferring energy. Work is the mechanical means of transferring energy. They're transferring the same thing, energy, OK? That brings us to the more important, well, for, for our purposes, by far the most important law of thermodynamics, the one that is not so obvious. And we're, we're working up toward it. And it, it, uh, it looks at disorder in a system and makes the observation that it is in a system that is isolated appropriately, so, it's so, so you draw a boundary around the, the system. I'll, I'll talk about what the isolation is in a minute. The disorder in that system never goes down. So the measure of disorder it becomes important. Now, what is disorder? Well, you measure it. I'll tell you what disorder is in a minute. But you, you measure it with a qu physical quantity known as, as entropy. And, and the, the similarity between the names entropy and energy is unfortunate because it's hard you know, recognize those are different words, and they are really different quantities. And I will ask you questions where if you, I'll give you the opportunity to, to misidentify one as the other. and, and It'll be nonsense. Um, you, you can count on those on, on the exams. I just do them, right? Because it's, it's, it's an easy, sneezy question to write. Easy peasy. Uh, entropy is a conserved quantity. It's a conserved quantity of doing things, and on and on. Entropy, I hope I said energy. Did I screw it up? Yeah, gosh. Rewind. Energy is the conserved quantity of doing, and you, you can't make it or destroy it. Entropy is this measure of disorder in a system. It is a specific quantity for a given system. You, you, in principle, you can, you can calculate up to, to a whole bunch of digits and, and know exactly how much entropy is there. And it's got, it's got units in the metric system and stuff, all of that. But it is not a conserved quantity. You can always make more entropy, and usually do. Um, we are huge en entropy-creating 
organisms. We, we go around the world messing stuff up and making more disorder. Uh, ask your parents. Uh, wait. You guys have let entropy go crazy in your rooms. All right. Um, so so what, cons what, what contributes to disorder? Well, it's any form of disarray in a system that is a system that has low entropy is easy to describe. For example, a one kilogram vase, perfect. That is a low entropy system. It's very organized, and therefore it's easy. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm, you can ask, well, is it taller than it is wide? And stuff? Okay, let, you know, leave the details out. But basically, it's, it's a very simple system. Uh, another simple system would be uh, you have a sock drawer with, you, 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 for some reason, you only care about um, blue and yellow socks. It's all you've got. You've got 100,000 pairs of blue socks, 100,000 pairs of yellow socks. And you put all the blue socks on the left side of an enormous sock drawer and all the yellow socks on the right side of, the, of that same enormous sock drawer. That is a highly ordered system because you can say, if you call somebody and say, so where are my, where are my socks? All 100,000 blue ones are on the left side, all 100,000 yellow ones are on the right side. Mission accomplished. Anytime you mess these systems up such that, that describing them takes more and more information, it's harder and harder. Um, if you have to, if, if, if you have to say that there are, how would you, how would you, the vase has been smashed, and now you have to say uh, the top quarter piece of the vase is over there, the, the bottom piece is there, this one is, is stuck in that one. It takes much more information to describe a smashed vase than to describe a whole vase. Same with the sock drawer. If you, if, you, if you jumble it all up, describing where all the socks are now becomes quite difficult. So instead of saying all the blue ones are on the left side, you now you have to say, well, blue, one number, blue ones are number 1, 7, 33, 26, and 43. You know, go on. Those are on the left side, but the other blue ones are on the right side. It's very complicated thing to describe. And you ha the, the more complicated the, the situation is, the more entropy there is in the system, the more disorder there is, because you have to now like, identify all the little pieces. And so smashing stuff or mixing stuff creates entropy. Um, uh, mixing salt and sugar grains. Two cups, all the salt is in one, all the sugar is in the other. That's good, okay. You mix them together, wow, now it's all, it, it's crazy with entropy, lots of disorder. Uh, you, can't, you can't undo this once you've done it. Uh, it will not, you, you can't sort them back out in any reasonable way. Uh, but describing now, well, that salt grain's there, that salt grain's there, it's a mess. Not. Yeah. So, mixing, shattering, and adding thermal energy counts too. Thermal energy carries with it disorder because it gives random, well, statistically distributed little bits of energy to all the objects. And now you have to say that, that, that sock number one has 2.7 units of energy, thermal energy. Sock number two has 1.6. Sock number three, it's a mess. Lots of description. And very complicated to explain the current situation. Lots of entropy. All right. So, it, an observation is that that entropy never decreases in an isolated system. So, for example, have you you have, you make a system that consists only of a beautiful vase and a wind-up toy with a hammer, and you put it in a box, isolate it, and you set them loose. And a little while later, the wind-up toy, which is just smashing, smashing with its hammer, hits the vase, shatters it and hits the vase again and shatters it some more. Hits the vase again and shatters it some more. In principle, this pounding effect, nothing is leaving the box. All the energy, all the everything that was in there is still in there. In principle, that the hammer could undo the damage um, and rebuild the vase. In practice, it never happens. It's so statistically unlikely, it will never happen. And instead, the amount of disorder, the details that, that are needed to describe the situation just keep accumulating more and more and more, and they will ultimately reach a limit where, where they, have, uh, they, they have as much disorder as is possible given, given what's in the box. And um, this we'll see as a typical situation that when you leave an isolated system to itself and let it, let it cook, so, well, not, I'm careful, let it, let it evolve in time, it typically drifts towards the most, the most disordered arrangement it can, it can figure out. As much entropy, it, it, 
goes to a maximum entropy situation, as much disorder as it can, and it will not drift back from that. It's just statistically unlikely. All right, so the laws of physics include these statistical laws. Uh, as I've heard often among physicists, the idea that almost nothing in mathematics fails to show up somewhere in physics. And here's an example where the laws of statistics are all over the place in physics, and they totally underlie the, the, the world of thermodynamics. And there's an entire field called statistical physics. Um, and they have great predictive power based on statistics. All right, so something I, I mentioned uh, briefly last time, but I'll, but I'll ask it now as a question, is, is if you add one joule of thermal energy, and yeah, just as, as, unit, as work is measured in, in units of joules, uh, thermal energy and, and heat being added to something is measured in joules. So if you add one joule of thermal energy to two different objects, one of them cold and one of them hot, which of these two objects experiences the greater increase or rise in its entropy? Um, which one gets disordered the most? You okay with the question? So how many think it's the hot object that gets disordered the most? Okay. How about the cold object being disordered the most? And how about neither they experience the same? Okay, so the majority is going, the clear majority is going for the cold object. And that is the case. Cold objects, because they have the, low, the lowest entropy to start with, are the most sensitive to, di to, to disruption. It's like when you start with your socks drawer and all the yellows are on one side, all the blues are on one side, and you give it the first stir, that causes the most damage. It, the subsequent stirs are just less and less effective. And the same happens with thermal energy. As you add that first dose of thermal energy to a very cold system, you really uh, increase its disorder a lot. And by the time it gets hotter and hotter and is finally very hot, adding another joule of thermal energy to it just doesn't do much. You've already reached, so it's got so much disorder already that adding a little, a little more thermal energy just doesn't affect it. And that, this is my little quip about uh, uh, adding uh, adding a, a rambunctious little kid to one of two parties, a, 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 a six-year-old's birthday party, adding it doesn't do very much. It's already disordered. But adding, it, adding that, that rambunctious kid to, a, to an oxygenarious tea party in the backyard uh, really messes it up. Big mess. So, so the more orderly something is, the more susceptible it is to, to the disordering effect of adding a little bit of thermal energy. So given that, I'll, I'll now state the, the law of entropy uh, in its sort of official form. It is technically known also as the second law of, in, of thermodynamics. So I will occasionally, by just because I do, I'll call it the second law. But it's better understood as better, better title of the law of entropy. And it observes that the, the entropy of a thermally isolated system never decreases. And so all the words are matter. Entropy, it's, the, it's, this, it's this physical quantity measure of disorder. Thermally isolated system is a system which cannot exchange heat with its surroundings. So the reason for not allowing it to exchange heat with its surroundings is because it moves between the system you're paying attention to and some, and some other system. They're exchanging entropy. They're moving that disorder around. And so they're, they have the potential of either importing or exporting disorder. And that's not... That messes up the law. That basically, that ba that basically, or undermines it. Um, so, if you're looking at the entropy of a thermal isolated system, you know, picture I, I said, picture your dorm room, and don't allow the cleaning people to come in, or your next door neighbor who is a slob, because they'll they'll change things. But if you just close the door and just rattle around your room, it will get messier and messier, um, uh, and the point is, it will never get, it will never get neater without, without uh, processes. I mean, you can do it. If you go in there and you neaten up your room, yes, it will get neater. But you will have, it turns out, you will have consumed order that was in you. You will have consumed your own, for example, the food you ate will have been consumed and now will have become thermal energy as you went around your room tidying. So you, you cannot beat this law. It, yes, the, dis, the, the disorder in the room as a whole, will uh, not counting you, will have gone down less disorder, but your disorder will have gone up more than enough to compensate. So, and this is sort of one of the things we'll sort of look at: is the is the movement 
of disorder within a system. So uh, just to, to reiterate on the law of entropy, if you have a thermally isolated system that is one that is not allowed to import or export disorder, particularly in the form of heat, uh, that, that's the thermal isolation, but also you're not allowed to have the, the, the trash people come in and take away the trash. That, that also violates the thermally isolated notion. Uh, so you can't, uh, such a system never, under, never experiences a decrease in disorder. The best it can do is hold steady. In principle, it can hold steady. Uh, that's why it says it never decreases. It, the, 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 a statement like it always increases is too strong because it is possible for a thermally isolated system to maintain constant entropy. It's, the hard, it's hard, but it can pull it off. Uh, you can rearrange the entropy within that system so that you can move all of the disorder to one side of the system, or you know, a lot of it to one side, leaving the other side uh, less ordered, uh, less disordered, less disordered, whatever. When you do that, you're making one side of the system, uh, typically if you're, if, if you're moving around, if you're using heat to do this, if you're, if you're ordering a system by lowering its, con its, the, its content of thermal energy, you're cooling it. And if you're increasing the disorder of the other side by adding heat to it, you're warming it. So you can make a cold side and a hot side. But as a whole, the whole system is a grand total cannot undergo a decrease in entropy. So you can, you're, you're rearranging it. Uh, you know, this is sort of reminiscent of the world of, of momentum. When, when you're flying a rocket, you, you start with no momentum. You throw the fuel one way, it carries momentum that way. You end up with momentum the other way. You're rearranging the distribution of momentum, but you can't, uh, you can't create it out of thin air. In entropy, it's a little different because it's not a conserved quantity, but you can still rearrange it. You can make an orderly side of your, of your room at the expense of making a disorderly side of the room. And overall, the disorder will have not decreased and in all likelihood will, will actually have increased. And that's what we'll do with it, with the air conditioner. If it's not conserved, you can still create it. Yes, it's very easy to create it. You just, just do something, uh, in effect, careless. So that instead of being very delicate about how you move around the, the order, m moving, moving stuff, if, if you're at, at all careless in the movement, you will create more disorder than you started with. Um, I think there's some, I, nothing comes to mind instantly is a great example, but that, but you, you will see that, that uh, so when you let heat, for example, flow from hot to cold, if you started with a room that had hot side and cold side, and you let the heat move as it naturally wants to do, that will create disorder. You started, and, and to, 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 to give you a, a hint at why, if you have a room that has a hot side and a cold side, that distribution of heat, which is a weird distribution of heat, hot one side, cold the other, that's orderly. There's some order in that. That doesn't happen by accident. Uh, the, what happens by accident is they go to the same temperature. So if you started with the hot and cold side, hot side, cold side, that order w can be lost very easily by letting the heat flow. Uh, if you let it let it go naturally, it'll just it'll it'll wreck that order, and you'll make, you'll end up increasing the entropy of the system. All right. All right. So. So natural heat flow, I, I've already claimed to an extent, <coughs> uh, results in a net increase in entropy. So if you think about this, how, I mean, how does this come up? Suppose you touch a hot object and a cold object to one another. Bunk. Well, the hot object will begin to transfer heat to the cold object. We've, we've already talked about that long ago. And as that happens, the hot object will say, let, let's say the hot object loses one joule of heat. When it does that, it it, that's the reverse of adding one joule of heat to a hot object. And as we, th that question I asked you a few minutes ago, made the observation that if you add one joule of heat to a hot object and one joule of heat to a cold object, it's the cold object that experiences the bigger rise in entropy. So if you do the reverse, you take it, heat out of objects. If you take heat out of a hot object, it experiences a, ver a relatively small decrease in entropy. It isn't very sensitive to, to additions or subtractions of heat. On the other hand, the cold object is quite sensitive to the addition and subtraction of heat. If you add that, that same joule you took out of the hot object, you add it to the cold object, 
you create a lot of entropy there. So you decrease the entropy of the hot object a little, but you increase the entropy of the cold object a lot. Overall, the entropy went up. And having hand waved that, let me show you it sort of illustrated with phony devices here. So what, the, what these two boxes are, are they're representing two objects. Those, they're two objects, and I can adjust their temperature. And at each temperature, or their content of thermal energy, well, which is the equivalent temperature, at each temperature, they have a certain entropy. So these, the, there are two dials on each box. They are not independent dials. They go together. So that when I add thermal energy to this, to this object, its entropy is also going to go up because it's got more disorder in the form of that thermal energy rattling around in a, in a hard to de describe uh, way. So let me do that. I'm starting right now with these two boxes, both of their or objects. I'll call, I'll call them boxes. They both right now have no thermal energy in them and no other sources of disorder. So they start with no entropy, zero. And that entropy can, can go up if we add disorder to them. So I'm going to add one unit of thermal energy to this box. In it goes. And according to my table that relates the thermal energy, a box's thermal energy to its entropy, th this table is kind of a, don't take it too seriously. It's, it's, it follows the right uh, rules, but it's not quantitatively accurate, so it doesn't matter. It's, it's, is it a 7 or is it a 7.2? It doesn't matter. So if I added one unit of thermal energy to this box, I can point the dial now to 1 because it's got one unit of thermal energy in it. That one unit of thermal energy is quite disordering to this originally very cold box. How disordering? Well, now we're up to four units of entropy. So this box, by virtue of having one unit of thermal energy in it, now has four units of entropy. Is that OK? We'll add another unit of thermal energy. Here it is. In it goes. And now we're at two. And the entropy now goes up to seven. It increases not by four, which, it, which happened when, we, when I added the first thermal en th dose of thermal energy, but because it's already hotter, adding that additional unit of thermal energy was disordering, but not as much. Only three units more disordering. All right? Another one. In goes another unit of thermal energy. We're now at three. And according to the table, now three units of thermal energy gives us nine units of entropy. We, we increase by only two more, because it's getting hotter, and adding a unit of, of thermal energy just doesn't disorder it very much. And I'll, and I'll add one more, because I can. Here it is. In it goes. I think I've done enough. I can put away my box of thermal energy. And we're up to 10 units. Woo, 10 units of, of uh, entropy. All right. Now, we got a hot object. Four units of thermal energy in this box. This box, same, you know, same type of object, but no thermal energy. It's a cold object, hot and cold. There's order in that. That's my claim all along, that this arrangement of thermal energy is not the most disordered one possible. There's a lot of order left. So let's wipe it out by touching them. Bink. OK, they're touching. You know, oh, you're so cold. Oh, you're so hot. Ah, ah. All right. Yeah. I won't make any political statements. Um, so now, when they touch, well, this one's got no thermal energy to do anything with, so it's not going to transfer any. But this one's got thermal energy in it. Whoa, there it is, hiding out. So it's going to, let's transfer it. I'm going to move it from the left box to the right box, from the hot one to the cold one, as in the, the natural direction, which heat flows. Over it goes. And in doing that, I've got now a lot of work ahead of me on the dials. The thermal energy of this guy went down from four to three. And actually, before I start, notice the total. Undo that. The, what, the total entropy right now is how many units? 10. OK? That's, that's worth noticing. So we did. OK, move the thermal energy over. There it goes. The thermal energy goes from four back down to three. And as that happens, the entropy goes down from four to no, from ten to nine. You know, any questions about what why, what I just did for this box? Okay. 
This box now has one unit of thermal energy in it. And as a result of having one unit of thermal energy, it's got four units of entropy in it. What's the total entropy now? 13. Entropy went up. The disorder of the system increased by allowing heat to flow from the hot one to the cold one. And what made this happen to an extent is that heat is more disordering to cold objects than it is to hot objects. So by taking one unit of thermal energy out of the hot object, I ordered it a little. But adding it to the cold object, I disordered it a lot. There was a net increase in disorder. Okay. Second unit of thermal energy, here it comes. It, it's it's going to flow from the left box to the right box. And when that happens, the left box drops down to two units of thermal energy. And its entropy goes to seven. It gets a little more orderly. It, 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 its increase in order was bigger than last time because it's starting to get colder. All right. That thermal energy did end up in the, in the right box, and it went from one unit of thermal energy to two. And associated with two units of thermal energy is seven units of entropy. What's the entropy now? 14. That's as high as we can go. It's as disordered as it can possibly be. Because watch what happens if I move one more thermal, thermal energy disk. Right? We got, you, know, you notice at this point, this guy has two units of th thermal energy. That guy has two units of thermal energy. Assuming they're the same object, give or take. You know, you know, they're two of the same objects. They're at the same temperature. They've hit thermal equilibrium. They can't, if we go any farther, they're in trouble. So let's try it. I'm going to move the one more disk. Here it goes. It's moving over from the left box to the right box. The left box now only has one unit of thermal energy left in it, and its entropy drops all the way down to four, because taking that unit of thermal energy out of an already getting pretty cold object orders it a lot. On the other hand, we added one unit of thermal energy to the, to the right box. It's now at three units of thermal energy, and consequently at nine units of entropy. What's the total entropy now? 13. It went down. Entropy went down in this movement. This is forbidden by the second law. There you go. By the law of entropy. You don't have a, a thermally isolated system. I, I, I wasn't really part of the story. I was, just, I was just part of the animation. But these two objects were, were exchanging heat. And had this one given the, the left one, given the right one heat, and ended up colder than the right one. So they started at the same temperature. And by the transfer of heat, the left one went, became colder, and the right one became hotter. Had that happened, so they, they developed a temperature difference out of nothing, entropy would go down. And that is statistically, that's forbidden for statistical reasons. It's just so astronomically unlikely for this to happen that it never happens. And so that's the second law is going, whoa, no, you can't do this. Second law, the law of entry is forbidding this. Questions about that? Yes, Dana? Is entropy highest when two objects reach thermal equilibrium? Yes. Um, that, that, that's, that's assuming there are no other ways in which entropy can continue to go up. The two objects re reach thermal equilibrium, and then they smash each other. Okay, and then they make more entropy. But, <coughs> but yes, things tend to go to thermal equilibrium. Uh, when you, you bring two objects to different temperatures and you touch them, they drift towards the same temperature because that maximizes their entropy. Okay? Um, things that will complicate that are Suppose there's mixing going on at the same time. Well, that creates entropy as well. So sometimes there are funny, funny businesses where two things drift to different temperatures a little bit in exchange for mixing a lot. And w there's one of those on the problem set where, where they don't necessarily go quite to the same temperature, but the mixing, mi the mixing is more important. OK? Um, in general, there are many things in, in, in life are driven by by, the, uh, by the, the, the relentless increase in disorder. 
that, that shows up in stuff. And so, that, so mixing is an example of that. It's very hard to unmix things once you've mixed them. You take a red and blue paint, throw them together, and mix them. Whoa, all the entries are skyrocketed. Undoing that is ex exceedingly hard. All right. So, so the unnatural heat flow. This is just a my my slide about what I just showed you, where where you you go too far, you move heat out of a cold object into a hot object. That decreases the overall entropy of the two objects, and is therefore forbidden by the law of entropy. All right, so which way does a, a, an air conditioner move heat? And the two choices are from a hot region to a cold region or from a cold region to a hot region. So think about it for a second. And how many think that it's A, it moves heat from a hot region to a cold region? How many think it's B, it moves it from a cold region to a hot region? Voting is thin, and actually the majority are going for a hot region to a cold region. Well, think about it on a on a cold winter day, uh, summer day. Ah, oh, gosh, what a mess! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could make another commit political uh, state. All right, I won't again to do that. It's the year 2100. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, on a hot summer day when your room is being air conditioned. The temperature of your room, out, outside the 100 degrees Fahrenheit, your room is 60 degrees Fahrenheit because you, because you really like cold. Okay. If the air conditioner did A, that is moved heat from the hot region to the cold region, it would be taking heat from outside and putting it into your room. What would, what would happen to the temperature of your room? It would increase. The air conditioner doesn't do this. You don't, you don't need an air conditioner to do that. Just open the window. Heat will come roaring in. It loves to do this. If it's hot outside and it's cold inside, whoosh, heat will roar in. That's the good old-fashioned direction in which heat likes to go. And the air conditioner does the seemingly impossible. It moves heat the wrong way. From the cold air in your room to the hot air outside against its natural direction of flow. Okay? That, now that it looks like, uh-oh, it immediately violates the law of entropy. The answer is no, it doesn't do this. But it has to, it, there's a cost to doing the movement. It's moving heat the wrong way. And that by itself would lower the entropy of the, uh, the whole system. And the whole system in this story is your room and the great outdoors, the outdoor air, the big system. If all that air conditioner did, the only thing was to move heat from the cold indoor air to the hot outdoor air, that would violate the law of entropy. But it doesn't. It consumes electric power from the power company. And that power comes in as wonderfully ordered stuff, equivalent to work. You know, the famous physicist, equivalent to work. It's not disordered. No entropy in that electricity. And it turns the electricity in the process of doing the movement, it turns electricity into thermal energy. And the thermal energy doesn't vanish. It goes outside. A properly built air conditioner adds that thermal energy to the, to the, to the uh, portion of, of thermal energy. It drops off in the hot outdoor air. So the hot outdoor air increases in, in uh, entropy. So let me, let me go back. I'm going to move the, you know, the thermal energy over here. <coughs> I'm going to drop that down to 2 and 7 and 2 and 7. So we're back at thermal equilibrium. This is your indoor air. That's your outdoor air. You don't care about it. It's outside. And we know that if we simply move thermal energy from the indoor air to the outdoor air, that's going to violate the law of entropy. We're going to go down in, in uh, the total entropy of the system is going to go down. But what if we we go to the power company and we shop for some, some lovely ordered energy. Ooh, white. Hey, it must be better. Blech. OK. And we, we use that ordered energy in the process of doing the movement and turn it into thermal energy and drop it outside. And so what we're going to do is we're going we're to move, we're going to take this thermal energy that, we that we're going to create and one unit of thermal energy that we're going to move. And the two of them together 
are going to drop out here into the great outdoors. So we're going to go to four units there, and that's 10 units over here of entropy. At the same time, this guy is going to go from two units of thermal energy to one, and its entropy is going to drop down to four. Can you follow what I did? We used, we used a, a, a portion of energy that wasn't in the story previously. It arrives as ordered energy through the through electric wires. And it then, in doing the movement, it becomes thermal energy that joins one unit of thermal energy that's making the move. So I, I remove one unit of thermal energy from, from your room air. I drop two units of thermal energy in the outdoor air, having consumed that one unit of ordered energy to make it. And now look, the entropy is 14. We haven't decreased the entropy anymore. Ener the entropy was 14 before. It's 14 again. Okay, We didn't violate the law of entropy anymore. This is permitted. This was uh, outrageously efficient in the sense that we didn't make any entropy either. We certainly didn't decrease it. We didn't make any, which is, alas, never happens. You can't run a real air conditioner that efficiently. They always waste some. It's like you can't get rid of friction completely. And so the point of this, though, is that if you're willing, in the process of doing the movement of heat, to convert ordered energy into disordered energy, it is possible to move heat the wrong way against its natural direction of flow. The cost is that you end up dumping off more heat in the hot object than you remove from the cold object. And the additional heat started life as the ordered energy that did the movement. OK? Yeah. Is that why when you run the AC in your car, you can overheat? Yes, for t actually for two reasons. When you run the AC in your car, it doesn't make the the, en the, the thermal energy of the car vanish. It pumps it. It moves it from, from inside, where it's cool already, to, to somewhere outside. And it's got to get it out into the outdoor air. It goes through your radiator again. So it's transferring heat into the same system that the engine is using, trying to get rid of waste heat. And we'll talk about how the, the engine is also moving heat very carefully. And it, it, it ends up with waste heat not because of inefficiencies, but because the laws of physics and thermodynamics require it. You got to get rid of that heat. Where do you get rid of it? You put it into the air by way of the radiator system. And if you don't, if the radiator system isn't in great shape or something, you can overheat the, you overheat the car. So yeah, that's a great question. Um, if you ever, classic failure of a car was you're driving along on a really hot day with the air conditioner blasting away, is your car overheats. What's the solution? Give, give this car another way to get rid of it, waste heat. I know this doesn't sound fun. Drop the windows down on your car, turn the heat up all the way on the car, blast hot air at yourself, and you're giving the, the car another way to get rid of heat by blasting it into the car's body, uh, the, w w the living quarters, and out the windows. So uh, you can, yeah, if, you're, if your car is threatening to overheat on a hot day, the air conditioner, you can, you, can, you can rescue it this way. Does that make sense that, that using, the, you, using the, the, the heating unit to, to blow heat out of the air, with you in the way, of course, uh, is, is very effective. Yeah, the, the memory is when I was looking at colleges with my dad, and we, and we had this really arrogant guy traveling in parallel with us, always wanted to tell us, tell, tell us me what his SATs were and all that stuff. And we came up on him, passed, passed him. He was boiling over on, on the side of the road, having, having done exactly this. He overheated his car with the air conditioner. And my dad could say, you know, turn on the heat. So, so for all his preppy ways and stuff like that, ha, got you. <laughs> Had no effect on me. I don't remember 40, year, 40 years later, 40 some odd years later. So uh, to, to then give you sort of a, a, a broad view of this, air conditioners are heat pumps. By a pump, pump that I mean that they, they move heat from, from cold to hot against its natural direction of flow. 
They do this at the cost of consuming work. You have to give them work uh, to get to, to pull the stunt off. Just like you have to pump a pump, a water pump. Their water pump uh, moves water from down low to up high at the cost of work. A uh, heat pump moves heat from cold to hot at the cost of work. Okay, so it's all it's all consistent. Um, automobile are heat engines. They will do that. A heat engine lets heat flow the way it likes to flow, from hot to cold, from the hot burn gas in the engine to the cold outdoor air. This is the waste heat, right? You're, you're letting heat flow that, that. And in the process, it does some work. That, that flow from, hot, from very hot to very cold creates so much entropy that you can actually back off on creating the entropy. You can, you can, you can side, uh, divert some of the, the heat and convert it to work, to useful work, without violating the law of entropy. So, so heat engines and heat pumps are kind of the opposite of the same device. All right. So that said, how does an actual air conditioner work? Uh, we, I, I, so far, I've described it completely in the abstract. How do they actually do it? And the classic way of, act, of, of doing it involves what's known as a working fluid, uh, a gas or a gas, gas or a liquid or something that's transformed from a gas to a liquid. Let me show you a simple, a simple working fluid, air. And I can show you how to make hot and cold. And I, I didn't bring a water bottle with me. But OK, this will work. Just a jug that contains air and a thermometer. And right now, the thermometer is reading room temperature right there. If I plug the jug, ooh, I'm a poet, and I squeeze more air into the jug, an activity that requires work, I'm doing work on the air in the jug, adding energy to it. Well, air has only one way it can handle additional energy, other than like moving it. You know, we can get it moving as a whole fast. That would do it. But, but for air that is sitting still, it can't go anywhere. The only way it can handle extra energy is to, as thermal energy. It will get hotter. So if I pump air and watch the temperature, See the temperature going up? So those of you who have pumped air into your bicycle tire, particularly one of these little hand pumps that's metal and stuff, it feels hot. You notice that? The, the, air, the air pump gets hot. You think, well, that's all friction. No, it's not friction at all. It's the act of doing work on gas. It makes it hotter. Right? So the temperature went up. Now you know. Down low, something weird happened there. Let's watch. I'm going to pump air in, and the temperature will go up. And I'll pump enough in there to blow the cork out. And when that happens, the air that was trapped and compressed inside expands. And as it expands and does work on the surrounding air, its temperature decreases. And it decreases below room temperature. That's the coldest thing in this room. We made something that's cold. You know, it's, you, it's easy to make thermal energy out of ordered energy. You just run an electric to a toaster. That's easy to make, to make things hotter. To make things colder is really tricky because you can't get rid of the heat. That would violate the law of entropy. You have to move it somewhere. And in this scheme, it was moved from inside that air to out into the room. So the, actually, the air in the room actually got a little warmer. That got colder. It's finally recovering. And so a, a simple-minded way of doing of doing uh, exactly this and making an air conditioner out of it is this this is syringe. You know, this is this is the syringe that you always look forward to. You're like, just a small shot. You know, you want you ready for your flu shot? Okay. So the needle. I should have a needle like this. Okay. I plug the end of this guy. So now, if I push the plunger in, I'm doing work on it. The temperature of the gas inside there is getting hotter. It's hot now. And if I let the heat now flow out into the room, it will, the temperature of this gas will return to room temperature and become in thermal equilibrium. And then if I move to some other location and let it do work on me, which is desperate to do, but it's, it, it's been looking forward to pushing out on me for a while. And as it pushed out and did work on me, its temperature went down. So whenever I push it in, this temperature goes up and heat flows out of it. Whenever I let it out, temperature goes down, heat flows into it. We can make an air conditioner like this. 
the really you know most stupid headed air conditioner ever. Here's your room. I come in. Oh, oh no, I gotta go outside first. Outside first. I push in and it gets hot. The heat flows out of the great outdoors. I wait until it's the thermal equilibrium. Okay. And I walk in. Into your room and I let it do work on me. Ah, it gets cold. Heat from your room flows into it. You okay with that idea? I walk outside. It's like it's like a sponge. I squeeze it out. We soak it in. I squeeze it out. It's kind of not very good, right? But the concept works. This this will actually happen. Those of you who have always wondered how you make liquid nitrogen, this is how they make liquid nitrogen. They just do it not with me, but with a really incredible sque squeezer. They squeeze it like crazy until it gets really hot. Heat comes out of it. They walk, they, they walk in. They, they go to the place where they want the liquid nitrogen to be. They let it expand, do work, and it gets so cold. They may have to do it more than one step, but it gets so cold it liquefies. Okay? So <clears throat> this would make a modestly successful air conditioner. You can do better. How do you do better? And it's like, yeah, how can you do better? Use a working fluid other than air. And so I will use this lovely um, greenhouse gas. You know, you turn these things upside down, they spray out and they get super cold. And I'm freezing my hand. Okay. Let's see if I show you this. Let's try the document camera. Oh, man, it's pushing like crazy on me. Hopefully we'll, you'll be able to see this. And, oh, come on. There it is, okay. So there at the bottom you see no, no liquid, or we're a tiny, tiny bit at the, right at the tip. Now if I push this in, I compress, I'm making the, air, the gas more dense than before, and the landing becomes, um, there's more landing than leaving now, and I condense it into a liquid. I should get a, I should get a reasonable amount of liquid in this. A little bit at the tip still, but I can. When I compress the gas, it tends to go to, to favor liquid, right? High density gas favors liquid. It tends to condense, and in the process, it releases its latent heat of uh, evaporation. It's hot. If I now let it expand, which it wants desperately to do, it boils. It'll boil away. The liquid will all boil away. Actually, there was a fair amount of liquid. Now it's, it is. It's boiling away. There, you can see it sloshing at the bottom of the syringe. It's boiling away and it's getting very cold. You can see the bubbles at that plug tip. Now I'll compress it again, and it'll get very hot, and it'll condense into a liquid, and then I'll expand it again, and it'll evaporate into, into a gas, and back and forth. And now it's, it just wants to come apart. Can you, can you follow the idea? When I compress it, it liquefies, and it gets hot. When I uncompress it, it evaporates, it gets cold. And now it wants to get apart. Now it'll go out there and warm up the great outdoors. And now it's just boiling away. So uh, that fluid actually is one of the refrigerants, I think. Which one is this now? Does it tell us? That doesn't work. Anyhow, that's how it, that is how an air conditioner works. <clears throat> the only thing we quibble about is exactly which chemical they're using. The point is, inside, where they want to cool your room, they let a liquid evaporate into, into a low-density gas. They then carry that gas outside and compress it with a device actually known as a compressor. And in the act of compressing it, they favor the formation of a liquid, during which time it gets hot as the, as the latent heat of evaporation comes roaring out of it as it condenses. They then take the liquid back inside and reduce the pressure and allow it to evaporate again. And that's what this device is here. This is not an air conditioner. It's actually a, 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 a dehumidifier. But they're all the same device. Dehumidifiers, air conditioners, refrigerators. Oh, I don't know. They're, they're all the heat pumps. They're all the same, same unit. This unit has the evaporators here. They're, they're letting the liquid evaporate into a low density gas in this, in this section. And this section then gets very cold as the latent heat of evaporation is, is consumed from the room. And it gets, so it gets bitter cold. They then compress that gas back to high pressure and high density and thereby favor condensation. And it condenses over here in the condenser which gets very hot. So if this were an air conditioner, this would be inside your room getting cold, sucking heat up. And this would be outside where people walk by and wonder why it's so warm out there. This is where the heat is being dumped off. And it's not just the heat that was soaked up by the, uh, the this, what's called the evaporator inside. It is also the thermal energy created 
by electricity in the process of compressing the gas, an action that took work. It takes work to compress the gas. And that work becomes thermal energy, and it joins the heat removed from the room in being dumped in the great outdoors. So that's pretty much the story of uh, refrigerators and air conditioners and all those things. So you can, go, you can touch this if you don't believe me. It's, it's fine to touch. <laughs>